Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another edition of the Australian Football Services podcast. My name is Anil Kapoor, and I am the Operations Manager of Australian Football Services. I'm joined today, as always, by co-director, Omar Rokokoglu. Our guest today is head coach of the Everton Under-18s men's team, Paul Tate, a vastly experienced coach with a playing career that's spanned across different levels of the English pyramid. Paul, thank you very much for your time today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Paul, for those out there who are not familiar with yourself, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history in football? Yeah, my, um, my football started probably like a lot of young players. I, I stopped playing on the street. Um, you know, we, we talk about the academy systems in England now where we haven't got a lot of street players because the players come into the academy at an early age. But I was your typical street player, just playing on the estate where I grew up and um, playing with different age groups, trying to get a game wherever I could. Uh, that, was, that was the beginning of my football um, journey. So playing with all the boys who, who uh, I sort of looked up to. And then I joined. A, I was lucky enough to join a boys club called Walls End Boys Club, which is a quite a well-known boys club in England for developing players. Um, de- developed players like say, Alan Shearer, uh, Michael Carrick, Peter Beardsley, who was a you know a Newcastle legend when I was growing up. Um, so I was lucky enough to go there, and all, all that was a, about it was a five-a-side pitch on a wooden floor with a, the old fluffy green ball. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was sort of like an amphitheatre, so you had to walk down the steps to go onto the, the five-a-side pitch. And it had like a viewing gallery up above where the parents, very often parents would just drop you off and leave you. So it would just be all the other teams. And it was a, it was a, it was a great environment. Um, and it was leagues from a very early age, so probably went there from the age of nine. Um, and there was league tables from that early age, so it was competitive football. And we all give ourselves team names like Brazil, France, England, <laughs> um, Australia. <laughs> so, so we all we all have um, we all had like really competitive edge then from that early age. So that was the beginning of my football journey. And then I was lucky enough to get picked up off Newcastle United, and was there for three or four years in their development program. And then um, was sort of went to a few clubs. I went on trial at Arsenal, Manchester United when I was 14 and, and then ended up going on trial at Everton. And something just clicked when I went to Everton as a, as a young boy and moved down to the area at 16, signed a scholarship um, and started my professional life at Everton. So I was there for three years, started my football journey there. It was, um, it was an amazing place to be at the time. Everton, Howard Kendall was the manager. He was an unbelievable guy and most successful manager in Everton's history, which uh, all Evertonians, I'm sure, will know. And then I moved on. I wasn't quite good enough for that level. Uh, Mike Walker was the manager, and he said I wasn't good enough at the time, so I had to move on, and I, I took a step down. I went to Wigan Athletic, played at Wigan for two years, but again, wasn't really successful. I had um, a lot of injuries. I was still growing. I was still developing. Um, and then I had to take another step down. So by the time I was 19... I'd had two free transfers, um, and then I really got to like the age of nineteen. It was at a crossroads. What do I do? Do I go to uni and study? Um, do I stick at the football? So I actually started my own coaching school. Then it was like nineteen twenty at the time. I started my own coaching school with a, a, another guy um, who was a, a coach of Crew Alexandra at the time, Terry Mac Phillips, who's been a manager on the football league since. So we started a soccer school. So that enabled me to earn a living and carry on my football. So I played non-league, played like in the fifth pyramid of English football, which is was conference football. Um, and I'd done that for three years and I, I had a fantastic time. I was coaching every evening um, and then playing my football midweek and Saturdays. Um, and then I was lucky enough to, to get spotted off crew who were in the championship at the time. So I was playing fifth level football and then I signed for crew and then I suddenly went to championship football. So I had a massive jump. I was 24 years old. It was a fantastic time to go from that level of football, non-league, which I, I really enjoyed, but it, it wasn't the be all and end all because I'd be coaching my job and, and my business. And then suddenly I was you know, going to places like Manchester City to play football and Crystal Palace and yeah. Wolves. 
Um, and then done that for three years and then steadily moved down the leagues, played in every league, League One, League Two. Um, bit of a journey, man. You know, I think I played for 10 clubs in total. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, yeah. So that was, that was my playing career. But um, like I say, I got into coaching at 20. And every club I went to, I took an interest in the youth team. I took an interest in the reserves. Um, I took an interest in the managers that I, uh, I played on and the assistant managers and the coaches and, you know, had little black books even then, writing sessions down and taking things in. So, yeah, that, you know, that was my playing career. Um, and it was, it was, you know, from a very early age, I had coaching in mind as well. That's wonderful. Nice, nice. You took me back to my childhood when you actually said that you guys used to name, uh, you know, your teams Brazil and England. Um, that's something that we used to do in Australia as well. Um, you know, everyone wanted to be the best, best um, clubs around the world. Um, yeah. yeah, you took me back to my childhood. It was good, good fun memory times. Um, so in regards to your, uh, your coaching, Paul, uh, when did you start coaching and what, what has your experience as a coach been? I probably um, my last club that I played for was Barrow who were a League 2 team um, and they were non league team at the time and I went there I was 34 um, and the guy who was manager at the time he said come in and play but also I want you to do some coaching and, and you know work with the boys um, so I actually got invited back to Everton when I was just finishing my playing career the guys who were there when I was a young player were still there. The uh, guy called Ray Hall, who's quite well known in youth development terms, he's retired now, Ray, fantastic guy. He was running the academy and he asked me to come in and work part-time. Yeah. So, you know, I was thrilled to be to get back to Everton. Everton was my club. Um, I'd been away from there for 10 years. Yeah. Which the dream come true to go back there and start coaching. Um, but my me, me, me first professional coaching job was with Barrow, so... I was player coach there. Um, we managed to get a promotion, which was really a really good, really good season. We had two good seasons there. We got a promotion, but that was the first time where I was actually running sessions, you know, um, helping pick teams. So I would do that on a Saturday, and then on a Sunday I would be working with the academy boys at Everton as well as through the week, like two or three times a week. Um, so then I retired at thirty six, um, and. And Everton quickly offered me a full-time role. I was lucky enough to get a full-time role coaching. Um, I was the under-14s coach. So my first job, um, I had a young player called Ross Barkley. He was in, in my under-14 group, um, as well as quite a few other players who are playing in the league now. John Lundstrom, who's Premier League player at Sheffield United. Um, Tyus Browning, who was now playing in China, played in our first team. Matthew Pennington, who was you know, a football league player now as well. So it was a really good group to take on at the time. I was lucky to have a really talented group of lads and hard working lads. Um, and, and that's where it started really, you know, and since I've, I've been at Everton 10 years now, what else was probably, I've worked my way up through the ages, 14s, 15s, 16s, and now I'm with the 18s. So I think I've, I've had a really good grasp of, a really good experience of development football. Yeah. And now I'm at the, uh, the cut and thrust end of it, if you like, with the under-18s. Yeah. Um, just on the topic of coaching, uh, obviously, you know, you've got quite a vast experience with the young young boys. And um, in terms of your professional coaching, what licences do you hold? And do you continue your coaching education? I've got every licence going. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a, there's a licence out there, I go and get it. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's um yeah I I think from the very from the very start when I moved to heaven like ten years ago like I said the 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 aim was to um, get myself educated um, I was learning on the job obviously coaching yeah. and then w working with these age groups at Everton but um, I was always very conscious that I, I needed to get the actual um, the licenses like you say and. And, and get on as many courses as I could to make myself better and, and to learn. So yeah, I've, I've started with my UEFA B, quickly moved on to my UEFA A license. Um, and then we have these awards in England now, which are called the Youth Awards. Yep. 
it's almost like um, an award for for guys who are working with youth players. Mm-hmm. So I think I think um, the licenses years gone back were, were sort of the year license was levelled at guys who were working in first team environments. Yeah. But now we're lucky enough the FA um, they run youth coaches awards, and and they've been really really valuable to me to me um, education. And then two years ago, I was lucky enough to get invited onto the English Pro Licence, um, which was an amazing time. It was an 18-month course. Um, so lucky to work with some, you know, really experienced coaches. And I think on, on, on the courses that you go on, you don't just learn on the courses. It's the people that you're on the courses with. Yeah. Yeah. And the time that you spend with them. And it's, yeah. you, you get valuable time in the classroom with them. You get valuable time. So I used to have lunch with Peter Schmeichel every day. Oh, he was wow. on my course. Wow. And, uh, I just used to pick his brains every day, Peter. <laughs> and, um, fantastic guy, dead open. Um, and I, I used to, you know, chat with him all the time about goalkeepers and, and United and, and um, that winning mentality that he that he had at United. And, yeah. You know, what was what, you know what, what was the feel? How, what made it special? So I was really lucky to, 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 to be on the course with him. Also, Stephen Gerrard was on the course with me uh, at the time. Um, and he doesn't live too far from me. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so um, he's, he's actually kind enough to give me a lift and pick me up and take me in. Uh, nice. To St. George's Park, which is in the Midlands. It's like 100 miles away from, from where we are. Nice. But again, a guy who pick his brains and, um, you know, Quite interesting. Office. I was yeah. just going to say it's quite interesting that he offered you a ride, considering you're an Evertonian. So, so there'd be well, a bit of a clash. Yeah, we had a few. Um, <laughs> we had a, had a few clashes. Yep. I have to say, when I first went on the course, he was Liverpool's under 18 coach. Yep. He was just starting his journey. Um, so we played against each other on the course. Uh, when we were on the course, he turned me over the first time, and then we turned him over the, the second time. So we had one each. Um, we had a bit, we had a, we had a bit of banter around that, but again, you know, fantastic guy and so humble. Yeah. Him, Peter, and, you know, not just them guys. It was some amazing people on the course, and it was a really good um, license yeah. to take. That's awesome. Good stuff. Uh, well, your boys are doing well this year as well, Paul. Uh, you know, in the under 18s competition, uh, two wins and a draw against Man City. Uh, you know, what can you tell us about the competition structure overall? Yeah, the under 18 Premier League is split into two groups. So you have a northern group and a southern section. Uh, there's 13 teams in both groups. Um, and it's Category 1 academies that would be in our group. There's a Category 1 academy um, group and, there's, and then there's the, the league below that. But obviously we play in the Category 1 academy. Um, and it's a f- fantastic competition for the players. It's, um, it's, it's obviously a league and it's competitive. Um, and then alongside that, the Premier League run the Premier League Cup. Mm-hmm. The last couple of seasons been the under 18 Premier League Cup. This year they run the under 17 Premier League Cup. So that would just be my first year scholars. But so I have I have two age groups obviously that I work with. I have the under 17s and the under 18s, but we work as one group. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they've split it this year, so it's sort of a, a little mini tournament for the under 17s. Um, and then we have the Youth Cup, the FA Youth Cup, which in England is a, has always been a big deal for, for youth football. It's, it's like a big tournament of the year because it's the time when the boys get to play in the stadiums. So we get to play at Goodison, we get to play at the weir grounds. It's a fantastic opportunity for us as coaches, but, up, but for the players mainly. It's, um, it's a really exciting tournament. So we're hoping to do well in that this, this year. Um, and, and yeah, like you say, we've had a good start in the league. It's good. It's good. Um, Paul, with your under 18s uh, players, uh, have you had any of them feature in the either the reserve team or in the um, all age team? Yeah, we. I've been lucky enough to. I think I've seen 30 debuts in the first team since I've been here. Um, since I've been under 18 coach, yeah, we've had, we've got a lot of boys um, into the first team for debuts. And, you know, there's boys up and down the leagues in England playing for different clubs in the Championship, League One, League Two. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd probably say the boys who were 
the listeners would know would probably be John Joe Kenny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked with him from the age of 14, John Joe. Wow. Guy who's been on loan last season at, um, in the Bundesliga at Schalke. Yeah. He's come back now and he's fighting Seamus for a place in the team. Um, worked with him since he was a young boy. Um, Tom Davies, who's made over 100 uh, Premier League appearances for the club now. Um, his family is from round the corner from me. He's a, he's a local boy from, from West Derby. Again, worked with him since he was 14, 15. Um, I actually moved him from right back. He was a right back at under 14, and I moved him into centre midfield. So um, that's, that's, that's one thing I can tell you. But again, lucky enough to work with him, fantastic player. Um, and then we've got a new guy who's just got on the first team, Anthony Gordon. Um, I don't think you've seen much of him. He's um, a really exciting player. He's a he's a wide wide left player, right footed. Um, just absolute modern day Premier League player. Um, physical specimen, absolutely rapid in terms of physicality, but yeah. got all the skills to go with it. And you know we're we're, we're hoping for uh, big things from him. He's he's currently trying to fight to get in the team, but he's got uh, a couple of decent players ahead of him and <laughs> yeah. Rich Allison and of course Jan yeah. Rodriguez. <laughs> So yeah, lucky, lucky enough, I think um, we've we've had a program at Everton, a pathway. We've always had a pathway. We've always had a history of developing young players that play in our first team. I think um, all our supporters love love it at Goodison when a young player comes on and makes his debut, and we can sustain it and stay in the team. Yeah. Uh, like I said before, obviously work with Ross Barkley as well, and. It was amazing to see his journey from an under 14 to England international playing in the World Cup. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think I think we've uh, been very lucky to see quite a lot of players go and play in the first team. Awesome. Nice. Uh, Paul, I'm just going to touch base on what you just said then. Um, you said that you, know, you guys have players that go from your under 18s to the next reserve team or the first team. Uh, what about the players uh, in your team at the moment, are they strictly under 16-year-old players or is there 14-year-olds that are also coming up the ranks that are playing in your, in your team? Yeah. Um, no, normally, the guys who, it becomes their job. So when they leave school, uh, so they'll do that under 16 year and then they'll become scholars. And the scholar programme is a two-year programme. Um, Quite a lot of the boys will already have professional contracts agreed. So on the 17th birthday, they'll sign their professional contracts. Yep. So the guy, the guys with me are mainly 17 and 18. Okay. But I, uh, my job as a under 18s coach is to keep an eye on the under 16s and um, probably going the second half of the year, I'll bring under 16s up with us and they'll play in the under 18s as well. Um, yep. If there's someone who's absolutely exceptional and he needs stretched. Because the under sixteen um, football isn't quite um, competitive enough for him, we'll bring him up to the under eighteens and he'll and he'll train with us and he'll play with us. So he's training against all that players every day and playing against all that players, which will it'll stretch him, um, you know, in all four corners, technically, tactically, physically. Yeah. So so yeah, the pathway is there for boys of 15, 16 to maybe come up and train with us, but. As a general rule, they normally stay in that own age group until they become scholars. I think it, it's very important, Paul, like you mentioned, and I think that's what makes the UK football so successful around the world is the fact that you guys give the opportunity for the up-and-coming young, talented players going up the ranks. And it's not something that's, that's done dramatically. It's done in the process, in the right process. And that's what makes you know, um, the football so great in the UK. Yeah, I think so. I think um, we talk about teams, but I think development now is probably the last five years. It's all about the individual player. Mm-hmm. So every every single player who is, is, is in our programme has an individualised programme. Um, technical, tactical, physical, psychological. They have a bespoke programme that's fit around, around them. And, and as we know, no two people are the same two players are the same everyone's different of course um, so they need that um, individualised programme so for instance I've got guys now who are 17 and they probably need a different challenge to under 18 football so we look at that plan um, and straight away when they become first year professionals maybe at 18 
they'll um, they'll go out on loan. So their pathway might not be from my team to the 23s. So that's the that's normally the logical step for my 18 under 23s to David Unsworth's team. Um, but we might think, no, this guy needs to go and play open age football. He needs to go and play against men to be tested a little bit more. So we'll we'll div- we'll get him a loan to a loan club. Um, and I think that's what's happening more and more in England. I think um, the loan system is um, a huge advantage in terms of developing players yeah. when they get to a certain level. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Paul, I was very lucky uh, during one of my uh, trips over to Europe. I, I took an under-11s uh, futsal team and um, I managed to meet the uh, West Brom youth coaches as well. And just going on what you were saying about, you know, psychometric testing and, and development, uh, we shared the bus on the way back from the competition with the West Brom uh, team. And I overheard the coaches discussing some of the uh, their kind of psychometric results with the boys. And it was something that really was quite new to me. I mean, I coach here in Australia as well, and I can say without a doubt that I have yet to see a club with such a structured and well-developed system. And I think it's something that a lot of clubs do try and replicate, but they don't always replicate it successfully. And I think having the psychological development of young players is so crucial, especially in this day and age where you know, things like social media impact so much on, on the well-being, the mental well-being of players, and that in itself will impact their, their performance. So... I mean, hats off to any club that's able to do it properly because, as I said, it was something completely new to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like you see, we have, um, we have a player care team at the academy. So we have a structure um, that supports the player, obviously, on the grass, like, like it always has, um, in the gym, at school. But then there's, there's, a, there's a care team that supports the player socially. So we've got a lot of guys who come and they, and they live with their um, house parents. And we have we have families where we put the boys, and we put we'll try and put them in twos because we have guys who live live away from Liverpool. So we bring them in and, and, and we house them, and and that's a big thing. If you move away, some of them move away at fourteen. Yeah. Um, but if you move away at sixteen from your family, it's it's a really big step. And um, some clubs have a hostel where they put players and they'll put them in, in a hostel and they'll, they'll leave them to get on with it. Um, we, we believe in putting them in with, with the house parents and, and families and putting them in that stable environment and s- having that support network for them off the pitch. And then obviously they'll, the guys go home at the weekend. We give them time with our families at the weekend after games and they'll come back on the Monday. But that through the week, it's basically 24-7 football. Um, we want them to live and breathe football don't we? we that's what we want but we've got to remember that these boys have got a life as well and away from football and both they need to have that social interaction with other young boys and um so i think we, we look at that really um you know we we take great care in that at everton in terms of the player care team and the support that we have around the players and that's not just everton i think um the academies in general do a fantastic job at that yeah. now in, in england um, oh, go ahead, Omar. Sorry, sorry, I know. Uh, just in regards to what you just said, I think it's very important, Paul, because we see that um, that caretaking during that youth development very um, very crucial in Australia. We see that there's kids that are uh, that go from you know puberty um, to to being adults. Uh, they they really struggle to find the balance of of social life. Um, with football life and that's what either makes them or breaks them uh, as a footballer it's very difficult yeah it's um i think when they get certainly to where i am now with the guys things start coming into their lives um obviously they start growing up um you know they start relationships they start driving they become young men don't they yeah Um, and and everything that comes with that, um, all the challenges that they face with that, um, you know, they, they say some of them say lucrative contracts at seventeen, yeah, um, early, and it's like we we can't expect them just to be able to handle that and just throw everything at them and yeah, 
these young guys to be able to handle it and, and just act like grown ups because they're not grown ups, they're still they're still young boys, you know. So we definitely have that support network around them and um, you know, old people like me with grey hair who have been around <laughs> and seen it and, um, and 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 know what it looks like and say, Hey, don't worry, we've seen that before. That, this yeah. is what you do, this is the path that you take and and luckily enough at Everton we've got some fantastic people around who've been there and done it and played for the club, played for different clubs and, and been footballers themselves and had them hurdles and made mistakes. Yeah. Um, so like I say, it's 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 the, the network and the and the the support that we've got at our club is, is phenomenal really for these young guys. That's good. That's excellent. Um, being a big name like Everton, I mean, most people will imagine that you guys have a, a large pool of talent or at least a, a large reach um, and a large ability to be able to find talented youngsters. But when it comes to bringing in talent, do you as a club look exclusively within the Liverpool area and the greater Liverpool area or do you uh, have scouts that go across the UK and internationally to bring in talent? Yeah, I think first of all, we... We pride ourselves on, um, you know, knowing where the best talent is in, in, in the area, in the local area, in Liverpool. Um, I think it's, I think the academy rule is, I think it's an hour's drive or an hour and a half's drive. You have to be within that to come to the academy. Um, because obviously you don't want young boys sitting in the car for four hours every day and travelling. <laughs> I, think, I think the Premier League made this rule where, it was like an hour and a half drive or, or something like that. Um, but we, we always pride ourselves on having local players. And, but yeah, the, the reality is um, the Premier League is a world league now, isn't it? It's, it's, you haven't just got to be the best player in Liverpool to get an evidence or Liverpool's team. You've got to be the best player in the world or the best player in Europe. You've got to be a phenomenal player. So we do recruit from, from all over the world now without a shadow of a doubt. Not hugely, I have to say. Um, probably not as much as some of the other clubs in our area. We, we sh I think we still recruit a lot more local players. Um, and it's a real hotbed of uh, the clubs. It's, it's a real competitive area. So, you know, within a 30-kilometre distance, there's Everton, Liverpool, Manchester United, Manchester City. So that is like really competitive for the best young players. It's not a secret anymore where the best young players are. Everybody knows where they are. Yeah. Everybody, every, everybody has seen them. So then everybody's scrambling to get them. It's just, yeah. You know, that's the way it is. Um, so you have to spread your net far and wide. Um, yeah. and, and, and we do. But we always pride ourselves in, in trying to get as many local players into our system as possible. I've actually got a we've actually got a, um, an Australian guy in our system, Con Uzanidis. Don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's um, he's an under twenty three player at the moment. He he moved over with his family at fourteen, not to sign for Everton. He moved over um, for family reasons, and he joined our academy at fourteen, and he's now a professional. He's a second year professional. Wow! Um, wow. Really, really good guy. <laughs> nice. Um, Paul, do you guys have any um, uh, UK national players in your team? Yes. Um, my, cu my current team have three players. Um, Taylor Nyango, um, Rhys Welsh, Lewis Dobbin. Three mm -hmm. of them guys have played for England at youth level. And they'll, they'll be hoping to get um, capped this season at youth level. I've also got an Irish international, Sean McAllister. Um, I've got a Danish international, Seb Christiansen. Nice. He's one of the guys we brought over from Europe. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Polish international goalkeeper. Okay. Um, Jean-Luc Leban. Yeah. Fancy name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got a few internationals. We, we, are, we actually have an international break now the same time as the first team. So that's coming up on the 10th of October. And, and our players will go away and, and, and play for the national teams and then come back. So oh, yeah. it's, it's a really good experience for them. You forgot to name uh, an Australian national, so maybe you're looking for an Australian national to be a part of your team. We've actually got a young boy called Shea Cahill in our system. 
Okay. <laughs> fancy, fancy yeah, that. Yeah. Have you heard of a guy called Tim Peel? Have you heard of him? Yeah, Tim Peel, son, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, Tim's guy, Tim's son, Shea, is with, in an under-16 programme, um, midfield player. So... He's a fantastic lad, as you, as you would imagine, if he's being Tim Cahill's son. <laughs> That's uh, it. I was lucky enough to have Tim in last season. He come in and, and done a bit of coaching with the under-16s and the under-18s. Um, come and work with us. Um, incredibly infectious character. Unbelievable yeah. enthusiasm. Um, I had him working with my attacking midfield players at arriving in the box. How good is that? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Dynamite. How good is that? If you're a 16 or 17 year old midfield player and you've got Tim Keel coaching you how to get on the end of crosses in the box, yeah. it doesn't get much better than that, guys, does it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, Paul, in terms of advice that you could give to young players, I mean, you have got such a successful uh, history of working with young talent. If you were to give any advice to young players and, and in that same vein, any young coaches who are looking to make a career in football, what would, uh, what would some of that advice be? I think the young coaches, it would always be um, what we talked about at the beginning, about making yourself better. I think you, you have to always be, um, you have to be a sponge for learning. You have to um, seek uh, knowledge wherever you can, um, whether that be go and watch a, a master coach work, whether that just be studying football, watch as much football as you can and, and try and figure it out. Um, you know, you, you can watch a game and you can really watch a game as a coach, can't you? You, you know, we've all done that. We all we get distracted by our family sometimes, don't we? We're watching a game. And, but then sometimes you get that quiet moment where you can really watch a game and you see the tactics. And um, So that, that would always be my message to young coaches. Like, absolutely... Um, be a, a sponge for, for that learning and, and, and really try and make yourself better. And then also, um, actually do some coaching. Don't just be on the outskirt. Don't just be on, you know, don't just watch, you know, um, get your hands dirty, get in there and, and work, with, work with, with young players, you know, whether that be six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 18-year-olds, go in there and, and, and try and, and, and try and work with them. Um, I think young players, if there's any young players listening or watching, I think the big thing for young players is, is work rate, um, dedication, application. That, that, that'll that never go away. That'll never change. Whether you're a footballer, basketball, you know, whatever sport you play, you have to be dedicated to your profession. You have to apply yourself 100%. You have to live and breathe that sport um, if you want to be successful. That's excellent. Well, Paul, thank you very much for your time today. We really do appreciate it. And uh, we wish you all the best for the, uh, the season ahead. And uh, stay safe as the most important thing. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, guys. guys. If you like this content, please consider liking, sharing and subscribing to Australian Football Services TV. We will plan on bringing more videos shortly. And until next time, take care of yourselves and see you soon.